So I'm almost finished reading Alva Noah's new book, Out of Our Heads, Why You Are Not Your Brain and Other Lessons from the Biology of Consciousness. Um, Alva Noah teaches at Berkeley, which is pretty close by, and uh, along with several other um, schools and programs, he uh, is someone I might want to study with for my, my PhD. I really appreciate uh, his work, but uh, he is somewhat of... Uh, a radical in the field of cognitive science. Uh, I wanted to read a blog that I just wrote about his book. Um, I compare him to uh, the views of Daniel Dennett, uh, which Alvin knows is, is basically criticizing um, a view that is generally quite like Dennett's uh, in his book. So um, I'm going to read my blog. I'll also post a link to it if you want to read it yourself. Um, I have lots of links to some of the words that I use um, and links to videos and whatnot. So if you want to look at the blog, uh, you'll get the background. So it is probably not news to most people that philosophers have a tendency to get stuck in their heads. This is especially true in the field of cognitive science where, for several decades, the dominant paradigm has led philosophers and scientists to look in the brain for evidence of thought and consciousness. The core metaphor guiding this paradigm is that human cognition is computational. In other words, that the brain is a computer. While it may still be mainstream, this disciplinary matrix has a growing number of critics. Those philosophers, like David Chalmers, who take consciousness seriously, point out that even a complete computational account of brain activity, which is itself still far from feasible, would fail to explain why said activity should be accompanied by experience. If the brain is merely a computer processor, if it is capable of performing all its tasks in a mechanical, algorithmic fashion, why should a world have to show up for it at all? Proponents of computationalism, like Daniel Dennett, who upholds a functionalist version of it, claim that we have too inflated a view of conscious experience. Dennett points to certain visual inadequacies, like change and inattentional blindness, as proof that our consciousness of the world is far less complete than we are led to believe. In fact, Dennett goes so far as to argue that our first-person experience of a richly textured environment is largely an illusion. We don't see what is there. Rather, we see the choppy, low-resolution fantasy the brain clumsily constructs for us. One might begin by criticizing Dennett for his reduction of consciousness first to perception, and then to visual perception specifically. But even supposing he was right about the overinflation of consciousness more generally, an insight, incidentally, of Jungian depth psychology before contemporary mind science, the claim that conscious experience is a phantom still hasn't even begun to explain why we, or the brain from Dennett's perspective, should experience such appearances at all. Why can't the brain perform its functions without our having to be aware of the illusion of a world? The computationalist theory of cognition would be true even on an Earth populated entirely by zombies or robots. It therefore fails to adequately account for the world we actually live in, that of purposeful projects and meaningful moral relationships with others. Dennett's is one of a family of greedily reductionistic views criticized by Alvin Noah in his new book. The book is made not merely of ink, glue, and paper, at least if what he argues for in it is true. If he is right, and consciousness is not lodged in the skull, then his book is literally a piece of his mind. Out of our heads, Why You Are Not Your Brain and Other Lessons from the Biology of Consciousness presents Noah's case that the dominant paradigm within the cognitive sciences is off the mark. Rather than looking for consciousness within the confines of the skull by supposing the brain's job is to internally represent a world it has access to only through five peepholes, 
Noah reminds the forgetful philosopher and scientist alike that thought is tied to action and that the mind is embodied and embedded in the world. Noah does not believe that Chalmers' so-called hard problem of consciousness is a problem at all. He and Dennett are in agreement about this much, but for entirely different reasons. Dennett believes the word consciousness is nothing but a cultural idol that continued neuroscience will soon call down off its pedestal. Eventually, he assures us, the hard problem will go away because we simply won't recognize our conscious experience as anything other than an illusion generated by unconscious neural activity. Noah is of the opinion that, th that though the brain is necessary for consciousness, it is not sufficient for it. He dismisses the hard problem as the product of misplaced concreteness, a term that comes out of uh, Alfred North Whitehead's work. The hard problem asks how brain matter might be in the possession of mind and experience, when really these emerge through the dynamic relationships between brain, body, and world, and are never possessed or simply located in the first place. I am conscious not merely because my brain is doing something special, but because it is coupled to others and the world via language, various levels of emotive intentionality, and a series of sensory motor or perception action loops. From Noah's point of view, a brain in a vat would not be conscious. Only contact with and access to an actual world is sufficient for conscious experience. Being conscious is something we must do, something we constantly achieve together with others and with the help of the world itself. Organisms and their environments can only be studied in the abstract as separate systems. To fully understand the evolutionary process of phylogenic adaptation or the ontogenic process of skillful coping, otherwise known as learning, one must develop a sense for the dynamics of the whole organism environment system. Um, and as an aside, my essay, Unearthing the Earth, linked to in this blog, um, investigates what the implications of this approach of viewing the organism and the environment as a single process or field or system, um, what the implications of this are for our being on the earth, for our uh, presence here as earthlings, but that's an aside. Um, Noah writes, we are, to use Merleau Ponty's phrase, empty heads turned to the world. The world is not a construction of the brain, nor is it a product of our own conscious efforts. It is there for us. We are here in it. The conscious mind is not inside us. It is, it would be better to say, a kind of active attunement to the world, an achieved integration. It is the world itself, all around, that fixes the nature of conscious experience. That quoted from page 142. The computational approach to consciousness assumes that consciousness is equal and reducible to intracranial neurochemical processes. Noah's rejoinder is a refreshing reminder that such solipsistic misplaced concreteness is, ironically, a product of the same Cartesian tradition most mainstream theorists rail against. That consciousness is located in the brain that it has no direct access to the real world, but through some internal language of ideas or mental representations. These are thoroughly Cartesian presuppositions. Noah suggests we begin not with the abstract thought experiments of lonely philosophers, but with the lived body and its everyday being in the world, among others. Uh, so, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, for the background, to some of these concepts, uh, visit the blog and you can click on the embedded uh, hypertext. So yeah, thanks for listening.